video? Sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you. Very nice to see morning. you. Too. Morning. Good morning. Yeah. I guess good evening there, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm good. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to uh, the talk and interactions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, so we had just uh, to brief you because when we started the day, probably it was, uh, you know, night or maybe late night for you. We had a very fantastic technical day. We started with the IEEE MTTL uh, deal talk uh, by uh, Dr. Song. And okay. then we had a talk in the morning, uh, followed by that uh, by Professor KJ Binoy. Just mm -hmm. now we had a, a talk by uh, Dr. Gaurav Banerjee. He's from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Yeah, no, yeah. Now we are going to have last and the you know, important component of today's thing. Our volunteer uh, will uh, start the proceedings formally. Maybe uh, okay. Shivada, you may introduce the speaker. You may read the biodata of the speaker formally. And then uh, you know, Dr. Koshik can start the talk. Should I share the video um, uh, slides now or? Uh, as a formality, uh, she will uh, read your biopic. Okay, sure. <laughs> just hold right. on for a minute. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So just to mention that uh, Dr. Sengupta is also a distinguished lecturer of uh, IEEE. He is currently distinguished lecturer of uh, Solid State Society, but he is also DL of MTT Society for 2021. In fact, uh, for the interest of the audience, I can mention that for 2021, we have already applied uh, uh, well, for, two, for two deals. So we have uh, you know, asked for uh, two talks by two speakers and Dr. Shengupta is uh, there. So if it is approved, you know, probably next year we can uh, uh, you know, receive Dr. Shengupta you know, through a physical event, you know, not in virtual. In virtual yes. Well. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Please, uh, introduce, uh, yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. So, uh, welcome you all to the fourth talk session of one day workshop on millimeter wave and terahertz devices and technology. So, we have the fourth talk by uh, Dr. Kaushik Sengutta, sir, from Princeton University. He is the IEEE MTTS uh, Distinguished Microwave Lecturer 2021 to 23, and he is the uh, IEEE Solid State uh, Circuit Society uh, Distinguished Lecturer. So, Dr. Kaushik Sengupto, sir, he received a B.Tech and M.Tech degrees in Electronics and Electrical Communication Engineering from IIT Kharagpur, Kharagpur, India in 2007. Um, and M.S. and Ph.D. degrees in Electrical Engineering from Caltech, Pasadena, U USA in 2008 and uh, 2012, respectively. In 2013, he joined the Department of Electrical Engineering, Princeton University, Princeton, New Jersey, USA as a faculty member. His current research interests include high-frequency ICs, electromagnetics, and optics for various applications in sensing, imaging, and high-speed communication. Dr. Sengupto, sir, he received uh, the Bell Labs Prize 2017 in YIP Award from uh, Office of Naval Research in 2017 and DARPA Young Faculty Award 2018 and the E. Lawrence Keyes J.R. Emerson Electric Co. Junior Faculty Award. He is currently serving as a steering committee member of IMS 2021 as work workshop chair as a member of MTT4 committee on terahertz technology and has served the technical program committee of IEEE ESSCIRC, IEEE CICC and IEEE ICC and PIERS. He is the co-recipient of a 2015 micro MTTS microwave prize. He is currently serving as distinguished lecturer uh, for solid state circuit society and will serve as a uh, distinguished microwave lecturer for IEEE Microwave Technic Theory and Technique Society uh, during the term 2021 and 2023. So I welcome you, sir, to this wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the warm introduction. Can you hear me? Is my yes, voice sir. audible? Okay, excellent. So uh, let me just share the screen here. Okay, I'm I'm hoping that I uh, the slides are visible. Can someone confirm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about 
um, terahertz chip scale system. So by the definition of terahertz, I'm, I'm implying frequencies uh, above 100 gigahertz. You already listened to uh, talks on millimeter wave systems. And so I'll focus on you know, frequencies in the 100, 300, and beyond. Uh, and, and then how, why is that a sort of a different dimension uh, compared to millimeter waves? And how should we think about designing systems uh, at these frequencies? And what are the kind of applications that would be of interest to us? So before I start, um, you know, we, you had uh, Dr. KJ Vinoy actually, and, and there was a question on, on internship uh, in the last talk. So actually, I did an internship about uh, Dr. KJ Vinoy when he just started in uh, IAC, and I was an undergrad student at that time. So, you know, that was a very, very good experience. And, you know, so university internships are also useful and can channel a student in different directions. <laughs> Uh, and so I just wanted to put it out there. Okay, all right. Um, so before I begin, let me just introduce my group. And this is a little older picture. Uh, we are located in New Jersey, in Princeton. Um, you can see the this is the building outside. Uh, again, this is probably a couple of years older picture. Um, so we have you know students from all over the world. Uh, we have students from India. We have students from other parts of the world. Um, and it's really an amazing place to work with, work. And so if you are in Princeton at any point or in, in the neighborhood of New Jersey, let me know, I'll be happy to host you. Um, you know, this is one picture of our measurement lab during one of those crazy, you know, chip measurement time. So you can see uh, people are all stressed out, but still happy. Okay, so I'm, uh, why terahertz? Why frequencies above 100 gigahertz? And I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, there's a lot of interesting applications for frequencies above uh, 100 gigahertz and even close to 100 gigahertz, so slightly below 100 gigahertz. So one of the applications is obviously communication, right? So um, you can think about really high speed point to point links, uh, mesh networks, uh, 100 gigabit per second wireless links uh, at frequencies above 100 gigahertz. Uh, why would that be interesting? You can imagine wireless backhaul systems that are low cost, easily deployable uh, compared to, say, optical fibers, for example. Right. So this is an effort that a lot of uh, software companies, uh, Microsoft and Facebook, are, are putting together, not necessarily at frequencies above 100 gigahertz, but really looking into wireless backhaul as enabling uh, connection to people who are outside the Internet. Other than communication, there's a lot of interesting sensing and imaging applications. So, you know, car radars are already operating at 76 to 77 gigahertz. Uh, you can buy them at $100. So you can imagine how cheap it is. Um, you know, communication across drones, uh, synchronization, sensing, um, uh, high speed wireless links for um, uh, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, and also for gesture recognition, right? So this is a uh, the, the picture below is a picture by Google Soli that's using a 60 gigahertz uh, radar for sort of wireless gesture recognition, right? So at these high frequencies, your uh, movement of the fingers are very tiny, so you can easily pick up uh, very tiny uh, signatures because your wavelength is so small. Um, there's also lots of security and imaging applications. So you can look at the picture on the right hand side. This is a picture by NASA uh, of uh, of a see through image at a standoff distance of I think 25 feet. So the person was uh, standing 25 feet away, and you are able to see the gun hidden on, underneath the clothes. And this was done at 675 gigahertz, right? So so there's a lot of interesting sensing and, uh, and uh, sensing and imaging applications. Yeah, just to uh, illustrate some of the more communication kind of applications, you know, you can imagine, you know, uh, communication between satellites or, or drones or, or, or jet fighters at 100 gigabit per second here. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, replacing, you know, sort of really complex optical fibers, sometimes in the data centers uh, for short range wireless links. Uh, and of course, I already talked about um, uh, wireless uh, backhaul links at 10 to 100 gigabit per second, right? So there's a lots of interesting applications. One fundamental, you know, commonality uh, between all of these is that typically they are based on beamforming. So they're based on some version of either analog beamforming or hybrid beamforming, or, or the holy grail would be digital beamforming, right? Um, and so that makes it fundamentally different from lower frequency communication, where uh, you know the path loss for the given distance is is much lower, and therefore you do not need beamforming here. 
right? So beam forming is the fundamental workhorse of frequent of, of these high frequencies. So I come from a silicon IC background. So what I think is 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 the best technology for frequencies about 100 gigahertz. Um, it's well, I mean, I would say that silicon ICs would play a definitive role, right? So and and I think the talk before already. Uh, commented on it or was on it, but just to give you a sense of why, you know, how far we have come in silicon ICs, we've all heard about Moore's law, right? So your integration or number of transistors uh, increasing every 18 months, and that's been true for a while. It's no longer true anymore. But what's the, what's interesting if you think about the magnitude of this transformation? So this is in 1960 on the left hand side. The first planar IC, which is just one memory element, one bit, right? Not one kilobit, one hundred bits, one gigabyte, it's just one bit occupying a whole wafer. And now you have, you know, uh, the AI processors from NVIDIA incorporating 21 billion transistors. I mean, just think about the magnitude, right? So from one, one tra you know, one memory element to 21 billion transistors in 60 years, right? So the other way of looking at Moore's law is that the cost per transistor has gone to almost nothing. Transistors are essentially free of cost, correct? And that, that number is still going down, even though uh, you know, Moore's law in the traditional way of thinking has sort of stopped in, in, one, in some sense. And so just to give you some idea what the cost of the transistor looks like, in a modern day silicon IC process, so I'm talking about you know 10 nanometer and below. Um, you can put in 100 million transistors um, in one millimeter square. Now one millimeter square, right? It's this very tiny piece of silicon. You can put in 100 million transistors for one dollar, uh, and so that's the that's the power of uh, of integration. And so the question is, can this enable uh, interesting low cost applications at frequencies above 100 gigahertz? And so we only talked about what is the main component of uh, of, of these frequencies is the phased arrays, right? And, but phased arrays have been in defense for a long, long time. Uh, you can see the Raytheon phased arrays. These are actually lower frequencies. This is for missile interception. Um, there are S-band phased arrays. There are X-band phased arrays uh, for your F-15s. You know, you can see the phased arrays here being installed in an F-18 jet fighter. And all of these were based on classical TR modules. So you get a galley marcenite piece of TR module. Um, you have some MMIC components. Um, most of them are sort of non-integrated. Uh, essentially, one uh, you take one galley marcenite module and then you build up large scale phase arrays um, based on that. You can imagine that because it is not integration, the cost and assembly cost and the yield and the maintenance of these uh, are very, very expensive, you know, close to a million dollars in some of these applications, right? So the, what happened in the last 20 years is that all of, you know, I would say, you know, as a result of the research by the university and the academy, in the started in universities and then into industry, is that people are now in a millimeter wave phase there is a become commonplace, right? Um, you, can, you can see the uh, sort of a, the Qualcomm 28 gigahertz phase there is, uh, you can buy a commercial uh, 5G phone. So, you know, the phone I have here, uh, it's an iPhone 12 5G, uh, which is a millimeter wave 5G, has uh, three, I think, phase there is of Qualcomm already inside the chip. You can sort of see on the right-hand side, right? And of course, these are low cost. Have the whole silicon transceiver with the antenna packaged into mod module. Like instead, these are these are sort of rectangle linear because they have like linear elements. So it's either a four element phase array or a three element phase array. All right, so, so silicon IC is essentially enabled reduction of cost in phase arrays uh, at the millimeter wave frequencies. And the question is, what about frequencies above 100 gigahertz? Can we do similar things uh, where, you know, terahertz in, in the way we have been thinking about has been limited to either really complex, expensive, bulky optics, really complex waveguide-based modules, um, or can we translate this into sort of integrated circuits um, uh, for future applications, right? So the challenges in the terahertz region are very are different uh, from the challenges in the millimeter wave region. And I'll tell you why uh, some of the cases, okay? So just for before I begin, I wanted to give you a sense of what has really happened in the last 10 years in terahertz and why I think that 
um, you know, the, it's been it's sort of an inflection uh, point in the in the frequency range uh, currently. Now, though, you know, the, there's been a lot of work in terahertz for the last 40 years, but the last 10 years has been incredible. And so, to give you a sense of why that's the case, I know this is a pair plot from um, from the paper Nature Photonics uh, in 2007, essentially plotting power versus frequency. Okay, so power is one axis, frequency the other axis. So you can see 100 gigahertz is here, one terahertz is here, and the and the point of this plot is that you, you know beyond 100 years the power falls uh, drastically, and you know there's uh, there's something called a terahertz gap. So you know there's no good technology in these frequency ranges. There's technology in the radio frequency. There's technology in the optical frequencies, but nothing in the middle, right? One point you can note is that the silicon terahertz, which is this red dot here. Right, 59 and 60. Uh, those were the first uh, demonstration of power above sil in silicon above 300 gigahertz. So that was 12 years ago. Okay, where are we now? Well, in 2018, the plot has completely changed. You can see that uh, uh, all other technologies are filling up. Uh, all of the MMICs have improved. RTDs have improved. Uh, photo mixers have improved, but a uh, drastic in, in enhancement of power from silicon from 2008 to 2018, where now we are capable of gener generating milliwatt level of power at half a terahertz uh, or in that neighborhood region, right? So this is an enormous order of magnitude increase from tens of nanowatts to hundreds of microwatt to a milliwatt level in the terahertz region. So how, how was this done? I mean, suddenly did the transistor technology change drastically in the last 12 years? It's not really about the devices here. The devices have not improved that much. However, the, we now know how to extract maximum power of the devices in spite of the limitations. Um, and so just to give you some numbers here, you know, in, in uh, silicon now you can generate like a one milliwatt of power uh, at half a terahertz and 100 microwatt at one terahertz, right? So the key aspect of, of this idea is that, you know, in silicon ICs, you know, we, we don't consider silicon transistors as very powerful, right? So it's, a device is not a system, okay? Just because you have an efficient device doesn't mean that you have a uh, efficient system. So uh, the idea of complex system integration is very, very important. And so what we'll focus on this talk is a cross-layer opportunity between antennas, circuits, and systems, as well as networks, right? So the idea of, of a code design across these paradigms really enables you to overcome some of these limitations. Okay, so in the last 10 years, what has been done? So let me just give you examples of uh, systems. So uh, this was uh, the first, I would say, the terahertz space array near 300 gigahertz, you know, almost like eight years ago. This was actually my PhD thesis. Uh, you can see the chip here. It's a 45 nanometer CMOS pro SOI process, 16 element phase array at 280 gigahertz. Um, since then, a lot of uh, work from our colleagues has happened. This is a one terahertz broadside array from MIT, uh, UCLA, 560 gigahertz uh, phase lock loops, uh, broadband picosecond pulse generators uh, from um, Rice University. Uh, on the on the receiver side, terahertz cameras, right? 1,000 pixel terahertz cameras operating at one terahertz from Germany, um, and some same group near field imaging. Uh, this is a work from our group on terahertz spectroscopes on chip. Uh, this is the work from Berkeley showing wireless communication at 240 gigahertz, right? So you can imagine that all of these happened in the last 10 years, and so it's really filled up the space of showing the potential of why silicon ICs would be a good terahertz technology. So where from, so from here where, right? So what is the next step? If you think about terahertz, right, in general, right, the kind of communication sensing, uh, imaging kind of uh, examples we are interested in, in many of these, it's not enough to, um, to be able to make systems that operate at single frequencies. Um, in in uh, you know car radars, for example, right? Uh, nobody, no, no, uh, you know, autonomous car relies on just uh, optical cameras um, or on millimeter wave radars. It's a combination of all of the sensor information that allows us to understand the uh, environment. So millimeter wave radars works at um, you know at uh, for sort of foggy kind of environment where camera doesn't work. 
infrared frequencies works excellent because of high resolution imaging an optical camera is obviously uh, the bread and butter of all sensing right so the combination of uh, exploiting these different frequencies that have different properties and merging them together as one image allows the next generation of autonomous cars to work so the question that we try to do this in this uh, paper down below and this is basically a review paper in nature electronics where me and my co-authors were thinking about what would be interesting uh, way forward for terahertz, right? So we have already demonstrated the key building blocks. What next? And what we were thinking about is that if you want to bridge this terahertz and application gap, you really need to make systems that are programmable, adaptive, reconfigurable, being able to operate across all properties of electromagnetic field. So if you think about what are those properties, for a beam-forming array, for example, you're basically generating some electromagnetic fields. So if you want a programmable source, you have three ranges of programmability, right? You have a programmable field, which could be beamforming, programmable polarization, and programmable spectrum, right? So if you have if you're if you have the ability to have chip skull systems that are reconfigurable across you know space, uh, spatial field distribution, polarization, and time evolution. These are the only three properties of electromagnetic fields. So if you can have, uh, you know, terahertz sources work, you know, being able to reconfigure on the fly to enable these things, you are basically getting close to the universal terahertz sources. And on the sensor side, it's the same thing, right? It's a reciprocity. So essentially, you're thinking about terahertz sensors that are also programmable across uh, different field distributions or angle of incidence, polarization, and spectrum. And if you are able to do those things, which we are very, very far away yet. Then you can imagine the smart, you know, intelligent, adaptive uh, terahertz technology applied for various applications in sensing and, and communication. Spectroscopy is one example where a single frequency will not give you anything, right? You need information across multiple uh, spectrum, hyperspectral imaging, where you need information across multiple spectrum. So being programmable across all of these parameters is one of the key elements to enable um, sort of bridging the terahertz and the application gap. So the question, if I want to do that, and I see the plot of all these various technologies, which one should I pick? If I want to pick one, which one do I do? And the point that we try to make in this paper is that, you know, this does not serve our purpose well. This idea of showing power across frequencies is just one metric. Um, it's not clear that for any application, you should always choose the one with the highest power. So if I'm thinking about some frequencies that say, you know, half a terahertz, should I always pick the green because MMICs and short key diodes obviously give you more, more power uh, than RTDs or silicon. And what we try to make in this paper that, you know, we need to think about this in a multidimensional context. Sure, power, uh, sensitivity is one and matrix, but there are other metrics. For example, we just made an argument that functionality, programmability, reconfigurability, adaptability is an important metric. Cost is an important metric. And all of these technologies have different footprints across these different axes. So if you think about uh, CMOS, for example, it has you know, lower power, lower sensitivity than many of the other technologies, but it's also lower cost. It's also easily programmable. You can include uh, in cover DSP in there. But if you're thinking about uh, MMICs and 3.5s, much better efficiency, much better sensitivity, but also higher cost also low programmability. So it, which technology you would choose depends on what are you trying to do. And therefore, we need to move away from these the classical terahertz gap kind of a plot, power versus frequency, to a more nuanced description of which technology is better for which applications and what do we need exactly from the technology. So given that the, that's the approach here, we'll talk a little bit about um, how should we think about designing systems at these high frequencies where your devices are not very good, okay? Okay, so first, the first challenge here is that, you know, if you plot Fmax, which is basically a metric for transistors showing uh, what is the limit, limiting frequency for power gain, um, I've plotted Fmax for silicon uh, CMOS transistors, silicon germanium, indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, and you can see that for the silicon transistors, the Fmax in the, is basically in the 300, 400 gigahertz range. And that is not going up uh, from you know, 65 to 45. It's sort of peaked around 45 nanometer. Has not, 
scaled up once you've gone down to FinFETs, 14 nanometer, 10 nanometer, and so on and so forth. So that is stopped. On the other hand, if you look at indium phosphide, you know, those F maxes have crossed one terahertz. So it's clear that, you know, if you want to make something at one terahertz, you should pick indium phosphide. So the question is, given the fact that silicon transistors have limited F max, how do we still design systems at frequencies that are close to F max or frequencies that are above F max? Again, F max is the frequency where the power gain of a transistor falls to zero dB or one. So it's essentially above frequencies F max, you don't have any power gain. In practice, you don't have any power gain even below F max because of uh, parasitic loss. Um, and so that, that that's a very critical frequency. So it's frequencies below F max is one thing, frequencies above F max is another thing. So the way we think about silicon transistors and, and these frequencies is that your, re, your transistors are not really good. They are not very powerful, but you want to develop powerful systems. So how do I do it? And I have I've used this sort of comparison in other talks, but I really like it because it's sort of true. So if I think about three, five uh, devices for the silicon, your silicon transistors are very weak, right? Uh, it's, it's really a David versus Goliath fight, right? So. But the power of silicon ICs is, is integration, right? You can put in a hundred million transistors in one millimeter square for one dollar. That's the power, right? So the question is not whether my silicon transistor is, is worse than uh, you know three five. The question is I have millions of them, and so the question is how do I harness power of so many transistors for making useful systems? And so that's the approach um, I want to take uh, in this talk, and I'll show you examples of the work here. So if you think about how we design uh, RFICs in general, uh, radio frequencies, millimeter wave frequency, terahertz, it doesn't matter. In all of these domains, we use this concept of modularity, which is the idea that you have some functional blocks, right? These are your sort of Lego pieces. There are two kinds of functional blocks. One is active functional blocks, one is passive functional blocks, right? Passive functional blocks are fundamental, uh, electric and magnetic storage energy, right? So this with capacitors, inductors, transmission lines, antennas, things of that nature. And you have active circuit blocks. This could be your transistor-based amplifiers, mixers, so on and so forth. And you have these blocks, right? And you know what each element does. And you're basically taking and picking and choosing and optimizing these blocks together to make a system. And that sort of works well in radio frequencies. But if you think about the kind of frequencies you're working with, individual blocks itself are not very efficient. You don't have a power amplifier at terahertz because your F max is lower than, uh, your, your frequency operation is lower, is higher than F max. How about filters? Filters are very inefficient at terahertz. So all of these individual components are very, very inefficient. And so if you try to combine these inefficient blocks to make a system, you're likely to get a suboptimal uh, system in general. What are we trying to do in a transmitter, for example, terahertz? At the end of the day, a transmitter essentially trans transcribes information into some electromagnetic field. That's all it does. A receiver or a sensor, on the other hand, ex you know, uh, uh, receives an electromagnetic field and then extracts information from it. Right. So imagine uh, it receives electromagnetic fields and extracts the velocity and the position of the car in front of you. So essentially, we are trying to link information to electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic fields to information. And this approach of taking these functional blocks is one way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. And it's not the very optimal way at terahertz frequencies. So what I'll try to give you examples in this talk is if I completely remove this idea and I think about the idea of connecting information to fields and fields to information, what kind of new architectures emerge? And do they look like this? So why do I think that this is an interesting approach is the fact that now at these frequencies, we are fundamentally at a different electromagnetic region, right? Um, if you think about say 100 gigahertz or say 300 gigahertz, right? That 300 gigahertz, your wavelength is one millimeter in air. Uh, it is like 300 micron in silicon. So your chip is several wavelengths long. So this didn't happen in radio frequencies on, at five gigahertz, for example, right? So we, in terahertz, we are in a new domain where your chip dimension is several wavelengths long. And by Maxwell's law, when your material becomes comparable or larger than your wavelength, 
you're completely in a different scattering regime in a in a completely in a different radiating region. So the question is now you can think about this creating these radiating surfaces that transcribe information into electromagnetic fields like a transmitter in a fundamentally different way. So this is the whole idea. So imagine you want to create this, what, what we said, universal terahertz source, right? So that has the ability to create arbitrary electromagnetic fields. How does electromagnetic fields radiate out? By Maxwell's law, it depends on there's some radiating surface. Classically, it's an antenna, right? But now the radiating surface could be realized on the chip itself. However, your chip also has millions of active devices, right? So the question is, should we be limited by that block by block approach where we have these classical antennas, you put them directly into chip and they do what they do, or are there other ways of realizing these radiating surfaces with active devices at sub-wavelength scales? And when we think about in that fashion, that I want these electromagnetic fields, let me calculate what the radiating current surface looks like, and then realize the current surface with active devices, you will see that these surfaces now look very different from classical antennas that we know. You can imagine multifunctional electromagnetic structures that emerge to this approach that didn't that that could you couldn't come up with with uh, you know with being limited by those uh, block by block approaches where you have a limited set of antennas and a limited set of circuit blocks and you're just picking and choosing or optimizing them. And so the holy, the, the sort of the, I would say the, the broader picture of this talk is that if I think about in this kind of a regime where you want to create arbitrary electromagnetic fields, either for transmitter or receiver, what kind of architectures emerge and what kind of functionalities emerge? Yeah. And so the idea is that if I have control of the electromagnetic fields, I can do uh, universal terahertz sources or universally programmable terahertz receivers. So let me give you some examples how this works out, right? So this was, again, the first uh, terahertz phase array that I already showed. And the idea there was uh, of the following, okay? So suppose you have a silicon chip, and suppose you want to create a phase array at 300 gigahertz. What is the optimal surface current on the, surf on, on the chip? And it turns out that if I want to optimize the radiated power directly from the chip and minimizing the surface waves, I can actually calculate what is the best surface currents on the, surface, on, the, on the chip itself, okay? It's not a classical a dipole antenna or a patch antenna. It turns out that if you had uh, circularly traveling radiating waves, so these uh, blue squares are circularly traveling radiati radiating waves, and you have many of them and you put them in the right position, then you have very nicely uh, 300 gigahertz beams coming out and the surface waves get canceled everywhere. Okay, now each of these traveling waves do not look like any antennas that we typically use. It doesn't look like a dipole, it doesn't look like a patch, uh, it doesn't look like anything that we typically use. So the question that we think about is that how do we realize these traveling wave radiators? So this was an idea that we had uh, at the time, which was, um, I don't want to get details on it, so the structure on the right hand side is one element on the left hand side. Okay, so this blue thing is basically this uh, loop. Okay. Now, you see, see that there are, there are transistors with coupled uh, loops associated with this. And so the way it works is that the cross-coupled nature of this distributed across these two loops allows, as soon as you put some DC voltage on this, there's a traveling wave oscillation that builds at 150 gigahertz. Okay? And so these two loops then behave like a transmission line. And then a transmission line, the currents are opposite in phase, right? So if the currents are opposite in phase, it develops a traveling wave oscillation of 150 gigahertz. Why 150 gigahertz? Because at that frequency, the wavelength is, is basically your, the entire loop length is lambda by two, okay? And if it's designed at 150 gigahertz, it'll oscillate at 150 gigahertz, right? So at that frequency, the two loops behaves like a transmission line, okay? Now, what we wanted to do was a traveling wave radiator at 300 gigahertz. So what happens is that as the frequency is, is traveling on this 150 gigahertz loop, the transistor are being pushed into nonlinear region. And because at 150, the currents are out of phase, at 300, the currents become in phase. Because zero and 180 times two is zero and zero, right? So the currents becomes in phase, which then essentially turns the same loop that was a transmission line at 150 gigahertz, the same loop starts radiating out, becomes a traveling wave radiator at the second harmonic. 
which is 300 gigahertz, which essentially means as soon as you put DC voltage, that's all you have to do, put a DC voltage to the structure, 150 gigahertz oscillation begins, and the 300 gigahertz radiation comes out in a traveling wave matter. Okay. And so how do I realize on the left-hand side, you take uh, not one of them, but multiple of them and create an array, right? And if you could create that, um, you have 300 gigahertz phase arrays coming out of it. Now imagine what this structure does. This is not an antenna. This is not an amplifier. This is not a mixer. This is not anything, right? It's what we call the distributed active radiator, which trans, which converts DC power into a traveling wave oscillation at 150 gigahertz into a second harmonic generator, into a filter at 150 gigahertz because of our transmission lines, and also simultaneously a radiator at 300 gigahertz. So it's, it's, it's what we call the multifunctional electromagnetic structure and came from that idea that let's try to make the surface currents with circuits as opposed to being limited from these sets of functional blocks. And so we took this structure and you know four by four array of it. I don't want to get details of it. All of these structures are locked to a central frequency synthesizer. Uh, you have IQ phase shifting. It's essentially like a phased array, and you can see the chip here in the center. You know this is a 2.7 millimeter by 2.7 millimeter chip. Everything else is just digital functionality or digital programmability. Uh, you can see the 10 dBm EIRP with um, electronic beam scanning. Um, this is a newer work at 420 gigahertz phase array uh, locked through nonlinear interaction. The idea here is that if you, if any of you play some guitar or anything, you use a metronome to keep, um, you know, frequency. If you take multiple metronomes, they all of these um, uh, would oscillate at different phases, different frequency. But you put on a wooden table that moves a little bit, and you will see in, if you wait for a while, all of those would start oscillating in phase. Uh, and in frequency. And so we do the same thing with electronics here in a four by four array, uh, radiating at 420 gigahertz in silicon source with a record 25 milli milliwatt IRP. This was an ICCC last year. And then we started thinking about, okay, so I now know how to generate continuous wave frequency. What we want to generate was a universally programmable uh, frequency, right? A universally programmable source. So what we said was, if I can combine multiple frequencies on a single chip uh, and have amplitude and phase control, you can create arbitrary waveforms in space. So that's what we did. Um, in this uh, world, you can see that you have multiple antennas on chip. All the electronics are directly integrated on chip. And the idea is that by controlling the delay of the signals that are come out of this, we can create arbitrary waveforms in air. So as an example, if the delays are programmed across these uh, elements, uh, you can get very broadband pulses. You can see the pulses coming out. And if I just program the delay to do something else, you can cancel all the harmonics and you have continuous wave signals coming out. So you can imagine this is like a one arbitrary terahertz waveform generator where um, we essentially, in this particular case, use two frequencies, 107 and 214 gigahertz, uh, to create arbitrary waveforms in space. Again, a 65, this was done in a 65 nanometer CMS silicon process. You can see some of the measured waveforms here. You can do, you know, picosecond pulses. You can do pure tones at different frequencies, 100 gigahertz, 200 gigahertz, uh, and these are some of the major uh, radiation waveforms, right? So you're now getting close to arbitrary control of time domain evolution. If you take the next step further, if I want both time and space, then what can you do? Um, so this is a new work that was uh, published in ICCC last year, and currently in Nature Electronics Review which was the idea of, of spatio-temporal field modulation. Now, this was below 100 gigahertz. This is the millimeter wave frequency, 71 to 76 gigahertz. And the idea was the following. You see that you know, all of these uh, ideas about spatial and temporal field control translate into different applications. And so this is one, uh, one example of this. So if you, if you were thinking about creating physically secure layers for communication, uh, what do I mean by that? It means that suppose Alice wants to communicate with Bob. Um, and if it's a phase array, you can imagine that there are multiple side lobes. So Eve is is the eavesdropper sitting on one of the side lobes, right? So what is Bob receiving? So this is a QPSK signal, and Bob receives high SNR. What does Eve receive? Again, a QPSK signal at low SNR. Uh, and so what we want to do with the physical layer security communication is that there is no keyword exchange between Alice and Bob. The physics of wave propagation itself incorporates 
security in the system itself, okay? So Alice and Bob are still communicating. The signal is exactly the same. However, you want to communicate it says that Eve receives garbage. So here Eve receives exactly the same QPSK constellation, making it vulnerable. What we want to do is Eve anywhere outside the main beam, you get almost noise-like spectrum. You see the spectrum is preserved in a phased array in space. The spectrum is not preserved in the spatial temporal array in here, right? Um, so how does it work? Well, I don't want to get in detail. So the, the idea here is that in a phased array, you know, you basically send the, all the symbols to the all the antennas. Uh, you get a large signal at above. You get a small signal at Eve. In time modulated array, we map symbols to different antennas. So this antenna is not sending all the symbols. We are mapping fractions of different symbols to different antennas. And it turns out that if I actually do that, then at Bob, at the broad side, you get the perfect constellation, what you wanted to get. But Eve, you get almost like noise-like stuff. Okay? So you get an almost like a noise-like spec spectrum. Again, the details are in the paper. Um, but what you can do now, you can see that your spectrum is now a function of space. Right? In a phase rate, it's not. The same spectrum gets repeated. So that's what we call a spatial temporal modulated array. You're, you're basically going from an arbitrarily spatial field configuration to a programmable spatial temporal field configuration. And so the one application of this is physical layer security. So this is, you can see the chip here. Uh, the chip is a, a two element uh, uh, time modulated array. Uh, and so we take two of these chips and create four element time modulated array. Uh, and these are you know, some of the things that you would see. So you can see that the constellation that Eve represents is just completely garbled in space. You can see that this is the, that if you're sending QPSK, Eve is not receiving QPSK. The eavesdropper who is trying to tap into your channel is receiving all kinds of garbled constellation, right? In a phase array, this won't happen. In a time modulated array, this happens, right? So this is very difficult for Eve to now get back the original information. So again, this is some measured results. Um, if I operate this array with the phased array, which is, you can see the, you know, Bob at zero degree and Eve at 60 degree receives the same constellation. Uh, but if I operate at, in the time modulated array, uh, you can see Bob is receiving QPSK, Eve is receiving completely garbage, right? So this makes it what we call physical layer, physically secure layer, which is exploiting, not through a password exchange, not through a cryptographic key exchange. Bob doesn't need to know a cryptographic key there is no encryption here. The is, encryption is happening through wave propagation in the channel itself. Okay, uh, and so this happens because we are thinking about spatial temporal field control from the transmitter end of things. What do we do at the receiver end of things? So I'll just give you some examples. Again, you know, from the receiver, um, uh, we have shown you know you can make terahertz cameras uh, in silicon. This is a four element, four element, uh, four by four element terahertz camera operating at uh, two eighty gigahertz. What we did. You can see the chip here. It's sitting on a piece of uh, plastic. Uh, and what we did was, was you can take this chip and you can take the source chip, the 280 gigahertz phased array, and you can make a all silicon terahertz imaging system. Uh, so you can make a, you know, this was, I, I guess, one of the first, uh, world's first all silicon terahertz imaging system where the chip, um, where both the source and the receiver are silicon uh, ICs. And so what we did was we put a bullet um, and a knife inside this toy. Uh, and this is the terahertz imaging that you see uh, for security. And when we cut it open, this is what you see. Okay. And so this was a and this is a recent work where we push the frequencies beyond uh, one terahertz. So this is a, a hundred pixel CMOS camera operating at three to three point five terahertz, uh, three thousand gigahertz to three thousand five hundred gigahertz as CMOS silicon camera. You don't have any sources, electronic sources at this frequency. So this is what we call the hybrid photonic electronic system, uh, because the source is a photonic source, which is a quantum cascade laser. So we use a quantum cascade laser as a source and a CMOS chip as a receiver, um, and, and we can create sort of images uh, at this frequency. But all of these are sort of classical, you know, antenna connected to detector kind of system, right? So again, go back to think about the example that I talked about, which is what can you do with radiating surfaces, with sub-wavelength synthesis or sensing that you couldn't do with that partitioned approach where you have these limited circuit blocks and electromagnetic structures to play with? 
And so this is an example of, I'll show one example here. We were interested in terahertz spectroscopy, which is basically uh, getting information from spectrum of molecules. Uh, typically, this is done in photonics. So what we started thinking about uh, in, in trying to make a spectroscope on chip was that you're basically trying to make a terahertz spectrum analyzer. And if, if you have worked with spectrum analyzer, there's a big bulky instruments in the lab, right? If you wanted to cover a wideband spectrum from say, you know, 100 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz, you need a lot of signal generators for down conversion. So what we started thinking about is that at this frequency, if the antenna is on the chip, why do we always consider an antenna that converts information into a signal? We basically started thinking about, you know, can we make this antenna itself a spectroscope, right? Because if you think about antenna again as a part of the chip, um, it's a distributed scatter. So when the signal hits the antenna, it excites uh, impressed current distribution. That current distribution contains information of the spectrum of the incident signal. So if I could measure the current distribution on the surface of the antenna directly, I don't need any electronics at the back end. My antenna essentially converts spectrum information to spatial information, and by exploiting signal processing, we should be able to estimate the spectrum at the back end. So that's exactly what we did. Again, the design is very complex because you don't use an antenna like that. So here we showed an example where you have an antenna and we put 84 detectors underneath the antenna. So the antenna is no longer connected to one receiver. One antenna is connected to 84 receivers, including the loading effect. So it turns out that if I could do that, then I can convert this complex spectroscopy problem to a linear estimation problem, which is if my unknown is my signal, my sensor information is a linear matrix of it, multiplication. Right? So I can measure the sensor information when the field strikes it. I know this a matrix, which is a function of the antenna, and all it is unknown. Right? The, the A1 is a spectrum which is unknown. So all I have to do is invert the matrix. Well, you can't directly invert the matrix. You have to apply some signal processing techniques. I don't want to go into details, but this is a picture of the chip. Uh, it's a log periodic scatter antenna. But unlike a log periodic antenna, there is no signal coming from the center. The antenna is connected to 84 detectors underneath the surface of the antenna. Okay? And these 84 detectors measure in real time the current distribution at terahertz frequencies. And then we convert that information into DC sort of rectified information through circuits, uh, and then use that to estimate the sensor, uh, the signal, uh, the, the spectrum of the signal that comes in. Right? So no mixer, no electronics, no LO signal generator, nothing. Just a single chip terahertz spectroscope that works from 40 gigahertz to 1,000 gigahertz, right? And we have tested this across frequencies. We have excited at different frequencies. And all we are doing is getting the sensor output, which is at DC, and converting into spectral information. And that essentially idea comes from the idea that your antenna is not a separate entity. The antenna is on the chip. And therefore, new architectures can emerge when we combine the antenna and the electronics in a way that we do not do at RF. Then we started thinking about what else can we do? Now imagine what we wanted to do initially. We wanted to create a universal terahertz sensor, a sensor that is programmable across frequency, polarization, and angle of incidence. So this was a nature communication paper last year where we took this idea one step forward, which is why is an antenna only operate at a given frequency uh, and a receiver? It's because your electromagnetic structure in certain modes, and you want to make sure that those modes uh, are efficient. So the idea here was the following, which is now I know how to create multiple receivers with the antennas. Can I then also change the nature of the modes of the surface of the uh, antenna, uh, or essentially program the current distribution on the fly? So the idea here is that suppose you have multiple de detectors, each detector can manipulate the local field uh, in small fraction. Uh, this could be done with a switch capacitor, for example, and then the question is, if, if I have some detectors completely on, some detectors half switched off or something like that, you can create a current distribution that is say optimal at 300 gigahertz. Now, if I want my sensor to be programmable at 300 gigahertz for a different angle of incidence, I have to program my current distribution. 
can I just map that current distribution to a different digital state on the detectors? And through the local manipulations of these um, boundary conditions, you're globally changing the current distribution. Uh, and if I could do it at an angle of incidence, can I do it against frequency? Can I then, uh, for optimal 990 gigahertz reception, can I just find the right optimal state? So the idea here was that you are basically creating electromagnetic states through sort of antenna and circuit co-design. And we have a lot of states. Here we have 152 billion states. And for a given angle of incidence or frequency of polarization, you're just choosing the optimal state. So now you have a terahertz sensor that is programmable across frequency, angle of incidence, and polarization. So the question is, how do I create those uh, states? How do I know which state to choose? So that is where optimization techniques come into the play. Um, and so there was a question on whether machine learning and, and things of that nature can enable new architectures. It can. In this particular case, we don't use machine learning. We use optimization methods. Uh, Data-driven methods are also something that we are closely looking at. But the key idea is that you really need to think about not this partition way of designing the systems, but creating uh, information to field and field to information, and you'd see new architectures emerge. Once, once we dissolve those partitions, um, these tools such as machine learning or optimization techniques come into the play. So as an example, let me just show you here, is that you see that we have five detector states and all of these are different colors. So if you want to optimize against frequency dynamically or angle of incidence, these color settings change. And by changing these color settings, which is basically capacitor switches uh, at the under the antenna, you are essentially programming the optimal modes for the given incident field. Again, the details are in the nature communication paper. Uh, and this essentially enables optimization from 100 gigahertz to 1,000 gigahertz. So because of lack of time, uh, I'm just going to move ahead. So this is a new work that is the cover article of the Nature Electronics December 2020 issue, so issue right now. Um, so please go ahead and look at this paper. This is the first pro programmable terahertz metasurface uh, where we took silicon chips, such as one, with 12 meta elements, which are passive scattering structures, but each of these scattering structures are programmable. So what it does is essentially creates holographic surfaces at terahertz. So you have a you have a surface that we create with these chips. So this is a surface. So you can see we take two by two elements of CMOS chips. It's a surface. You have a field coming in, incident field, and by programming digital programming of this metasurface structure, you can create whatever field you want to create here. So you can imagine that you have smart surfaces, right? You have a blockage on your terahertz link. You get the transmitter to transmit somewhere else. This smart surface has no power, has no DC power, just a passive reflecting surface. By changing the nature of this reflecting surface, you basically you can create multiple beams. Um, uh, you can independently transcribe information and so on and so forth. So in the classical microwave region, we will call it reflector array, right? Uh, it, we call this metasurface because the this is not just for far field, this is also for near field. The spacing between these scatterers is lambda by five, so these really sub-wavelength. And this is what we call the fully programmable scalable, uh, scalable holographic surface. So as an example, this is measured results, um, uh, you know, measured results of beam forming. So an incident beam comes. When it comes out of the surface, it is multiple beams. Um, you can do holographic projections. So if we project Princeton University at 300 gigahertz we, uh, uh, on the surface of the chip, and so on and so forth. So just to end here, I, all I'm saying is that, you know, if, I, if you have to take one, one element from here is the idea that don't think about system design as partitioned. I have amplifiers and mixers and, and all of these things and I have to connect these things together to design systems. When we remove those partition areas and just think about what is a transmitter trying to do, what is a receiver trying to do, which is information to fields and fields to information, you suddenly in a new regime where new architectures emerge that look very different from classical architecture that have very different trade-offs from classical architecture and enable new functionalities that it couldn't do before. Uh, and I've shown examples of programmable terahertz sources, programmable terahertz sensors that you just couldn't do with a classical antenna connected to a receiver kind of an approach. And, and then through this kind of electromagnetically influenced uh, regime, 
I think new, you know, terahertz systems and you know uh, architectures would emerge, uh, and new applications would emerge from that. So devices need to talk to systems, and it's a holistic approach. With that, I will acknowledge my sponsors here, and I'm running out of time. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you again. Thank you, Tajik, uh, for the wonderful talk and covering so many aspects of your research area and the research journey. So yeah. there are a few queries in chat box. So okay. would you like to take uh, from the chat box directly or you want yeah, yeah, to let me just take that. Um, yeah, maybe uh, after seven, uh, seven o'clock, whatever there is for you. Okay. Um, right. So the question is, what are attenuation consideration terahertz bands? Uh, the well, it's a it's an important question. It's a it's a question is what is the attenuation? And the, the attenuation below two hundred gigahertz is is not that much. Uh, the question is actually uh, the uncertainty in absorption, right? Which is basically if you have moisture, you have rain, the attenuation degree uh, increases uh, tremendously. But that's also a problem at um, Millimeter wave, and so the idea is that you choose those particular bands where you have lower attenuation compared to others, which is why 60 gigahertz become popular because it has better uh, propagation than other frequencies. 94 gigahertz become popular because it has better propagation than other frequencies. Sometimes the attenuation is good to make uh, secure links. So if you don't want the information to go for further away, and uh, sometimes the attenuation is good. Okay, uh, then the question is EMI EMC challenges. Uh, I mean that's a that, in terms, I mean, there's nothing particular about EMI EMC challenges in terahertz. I think the challenge there is how do we package antennas uh, and radiating uh, structures um, uh, in one chip, and therefore the packaging technology becomes uh, very, very important. Uh, then there's a question on sensors and sources on one chip. Are the different models? They're not even models. They're, as I said, I mean, the, the entire system is integrated on chip. So it's we the antennas are on chip, the detectors are on chip again, but antennas detectors are on chip even for millimeter waves, right? So the difference here is that we are not considering the classical antenna regime connected to the receivers. I mean that's the holy thing, right? That's a, that's the main objective of this work, um, and that's where it's coming from. And uh, how is six G communication possible? I don't think I can answer that question in in, in two minutes. So. Yeah, 6G communication is possible. That's the answer to the question. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I mean, I'll be happy to take any live questions as well. Yeah, so it's not a proper question. Probably I'll, uh, uh, you know, try to know something from you regarding uh, the, for the beginners in this uh, podium, virtual podium, there are a lot of youngsters, uh, students, research scholars. So for them, if you can tell, like, uh, you know, from Indian perspective, so you have uh, done your early career education in India. So you know the difficulties that uh, some of the Indian universities, even top level institute face. So when you right, talk right. about the type of, you know, the circuit, especially the type of clean room facility that is needed for some of the device fabrication, etc. So how do you think that this, uh, you know, the lack of the facilities, in spite of having those lack of facilities, uh, quality research can be done, uh, especially yeah. in a nanoscale mm -hmm. and a terrace design. So what is your suggestion? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And I think two things, right? One is, um, one is strategic. Strategic in the sense that, you know, device application is tough. Right, and, and device fabrication is requires a lot of work, expertise, and so on and so forth. So the thing that we do are sort of commercial foundry, right? So we are sort of cheating in that regard, right? We are not fabricating the devices ourselves. Of course, we are packaging and uh, and think of the antennas and things of that nature. And by you know offloading some of this more complex fabrication to commercial foundries, silicon foundries, that's what silicon ICs do, right? You're able to make complex systems, and, and I guess the the journey that we want to take is is towards complex terahertz systems on chip, and this is enabled uh, by by putting these chips uh, into external foundries. The testing is still difficult, and the testing is still expensive, 
and uh, and that's a question that's um that's uh, i mean there's no right easy answer to it right so if if i didn't have testing facility what would i do i mean then i have to send my students somewhere else to test and it's always much difficult if you don't have the testing facilities so but i also, also just wanted to finish my point is that if you think about who did the first millimeter wave research in the world well it came from calcutta right and yeah. if you actually yeah. read uh, the some of the components uh, that was used in the late 1800s, right? Um, it, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, uh, he would be making terahertz, you know, sort of millimeter wave polarizers with jute strings. Um, he would take, um, you know, uh, these telephone books and big slits, making it uh, filters and things of that nature spring filters and things. I mean, I'm not saying that you have to do it now, but I'm saying that there are ways to think about creative ways of enabling systems, right? Uh, maybe there are some opportunities with IIST being being closed, uh, but again, it depends on exactly uh, where you're located. My point is that, you know, one thing is that you may, be, may need to think about this in a more creative fashion, right? As opposed to be thinking about what limits me is that what do I want to do and then figure out, you know, how do I do it? Yeah, so just uh, to add to the points that you are mentioning that in there are a few pockets or terage uh, activities are going on. Of course, we are one of them and there is IIC at IIT Delhi, there is a network analyzer up to one terahertz, etc. So some facilities are there, but you know, the main point I was trying to talk about, you know, getting everything together uh, in the same campus uh, is something uh, which is very difficult over here. So right. another point right. is, uh, can you mention the, the the major applications of terahertz? Like we talk about a lot of physics, a lot of, uh, you know, it is a different, uh, even terahertz, antennas are not like classical antennas. Its excitation mechanism is different. There are photoconductive antennas. There are other kind of structure. So even though the basic mechanism or the basic antenna structure remains same, uh, so, I mean, overall, you know, the uh, main thing is as far as the communication is concerned, the far field communication is concerned, Terahertz is, is not the candidate. So, uh, what are the major applications from the industry perspective uh, that you see yeah. for Terahertz over yeah. the last decade or so? Right, right. And it, uh, yeah, so uh, that's the question, right? So, I start with specifying some of the applications here. And I think, you know, the lower terahertz are, it depends on how you define terahertz, right? So uh, if you're thinking about 300 gigahertz and beyond, um, I think the applications are, uh, will still come, but later, but I think there's a lot of work happening above 100 gigahertz, for example, already, right? In the, in the optic society, they define uh, terahertz from 100 gigahertz and beyond. And so if I take that definition, you know, there's a lot of work happening at 140 gigahertz, for example, in, in, in the wireless backhaul system. Uh, communication, uh, really high speed communication. Again, the idea is that you can make low cost phased arrays and you know you can you know tile them to create uh, high EIRP and, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of sensing and imaging, I think there's a lot of applications between 100 and 200. Uh, anything above 200 essentially creates a little uh, problem for long distance, given the fact that uh, your power is limited. Um, so with regards to you know the antenna designs and so on and so forth, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of work happening in the photonics domain, right? Which is in the terahertz photonic photoconductive antennas and so on and so forth. Right. And this is primarily above one terahertz and, and maybe half a terahertz and beyond. Um, you know, for the electronic side of things, I think there's a lot of interest in between the 100 and the 200 gigahertz range. So if you are in that space, I think there's a interest in the industry side of things. There is also technology that is out there that's uh, that's doable. And maybe, you know, that might be the first step to think about systems in that frequency range. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Kaushik, Dr. Kaushik. Shah. Sure, thank you so much for that. Like, uh, you know, before we close, I would request you, you know, to say something not technical, but to encourage the youngsters. If you talk about your journey from Kharagpur to NASA, yeah. JPL, and then yeah. to, you know, the university at US. So if you can just talk yeah. about yeah. your journey, that would motivate a lot of uh, youngsters over here. You know, just very briefly, if you can talk about, yeah. Sure, we'd be happy to, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's very unpredictable how how research paths move. Uh, and, and so, um, 
when I went from, I, I did my undergrad, I did my schooling in Calcutta, right? And then uh, I went to IIT Kharagpur, did the integrated uh, BTEC and tech, uh, graduated in 2007, and uh, then went to Caltech. And so the group I joined was one of the first groups that demonstrated a millimeter wave phase array uh, at 77 gigahertz. Um, and then we wanted to do, I wanted to do something at 300 and beyond. Uh, the 300 gigahertz phase are example that I said, and they had no instrumentation at that frequency. This is 2007, right? The world looked very, very different yeah. 13 years ago, um, and they didn't have any instrumentation. So the question is, transaction came into picture. <laughs> this is uh, yeah, this is much before. I mean, this the general transaction came into picture when Peter Siegel was still in, in JPL right. in Caltech, and so Peter Siegel used to work at Caltech in few doors down the way, right? Um, and so I told him, look, I mean, I already taped out the chip. I, I, in my third year, it, it's, it's funny that you shouldn't, you shouldn't always try to optimize your journey. And some things happen randomly, and, let it, and, and maybe this, this is an element of inspiration, which is I taped out the chip in the 300 years phased array, and I had no idea how to test it. So I said, you know, and, and then I asked people around VDI, the Virginia Diodes company, had just come about a uh, very low number of components. Uh, if I order something comes back like six months later and very expensive. And I had no confidence that this is going to work. Okay. So I couldn't afford to tell my advisor, look, you know, you have to spend like maybe in Indian rupees, you know, one crore to buy these components. And I don't even know if my chip is going to work. So I told Peter Siegel, said, Peter, uh, can you help me out? And he said, well, you know, you are not a US citizen, so you cannot go to JPL. So, you know, you figure your way out. So then I, what I did was I started sending out emails to my friends. So it's like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to measure these frequencies at these frequencies. What do I do? I have nothing at this point. And it turns out that I was in electrical engineering in geophysics. They were measuring rocks uh, and rock spectroscopy uh, at terahertz frequencies. Okay, and they had these 300 gigahertz modules to train students uh, because they were working at beyond one terahertz, right? So they had these modules lying around and so on and so forth. And it turns out an astrophysics department was looking at black body radiation at these frequencies, and so they had some modules run around. And so what I did was I took a cart and went to geophysics, co collected the components, took a car to astrophysics, collected the components, and built like a small terahertz lab with borrowed components from everywhere. Uh, and then basically created a terahertz lab myself. Uh, and you know, they, this had to do, right? Sometimes, you know, necessary is a, necessity is a mother of invention, right? Uh, so you have to figure out ways around it. You cannot be, just be limited by, well, my advisor doesn't have it, so we cannot do it. Uh, and, 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 and you just have a little more, Enterprising. I think in research, wherever you are located, uh, it, there is there is a there is a component of just figuring things out, right? And I, if you have that, you know, the things will fall into place. But again, you know, expand your horizon. Don't get limited to one area. Uh, future is multidisciplinary. So read about what's going on in other fields. It's it's actually very very important. Yeah. Exactly, like uh, terahertz research and you know doing uh, any type of application-oriented research is always multidisciplinary, and it is more so for terahertz, I believe. Right, it's where the optics and electronics meet. So read about optics, read about yeah. electromagnetics. If you don't know electromagnetics, right. terahertz is going to be tough. Uh, so electromagnetics exactly. is just fundamental to understanding this. Yeah, yeah. So, so the last last question: uh, When can we uh, have a <laughs> physical deal with you? Twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two? I well, let's figure out. Let's figure out when I get the vaccine, right? Or, <laughs> or the vaccine comes. <laughs> um, I just got the uh, yeah. DDL list, and I saw that uh, you probably listed as virtual right now. Um, so, if you yeah. want to make it physical, I don't know what the next steps are. Maybe we can communicate and if we can manage a trip um, next year, that'll be great. Um, yeah. But let's see you know, when the, how the vaccine situation develops. Anyway, yeah, anyway, anyway whenever you visit India and you know, Calcutta, just let us know. We're very happy to host you here in Kerala, Trivandrum. And Absolutely, my pleasure. And the student branches are very active. So 
with this we will come to the fag end of the event thank you very much dr koshik shen gupta thank you thank you, you dr shen to the youngsters yeah you have already achieved a lot and we know that many many feathers are due on you so uh, our uh, chapter secretary will now propose a formal vote of thanks and we will conclude the day after that thank you dr shah for the invitation uh, yeah professor anu mohammad yes sir yes sir so please go ahead on behalf of mdts kerala section ap mdts sb chapters iast and gc barton hill would like to thank all distinguished guests dml speaker invited speakers and participants who accepted our invitation for the workshop on millimeter wave and terahertz devices and technology latest trends and future directions we are proud and happy to have renowned speakers in mtt domain starting from dr song who gave a talk on terahertz communication at 300 gigahertz devices packages and systems followed by dr kj vinoy on face darays for 5g millimeter wave communication and later by dr gaurav banerjee in millimeter wave circuit testing chips chips we are very thankful to you all and in essence the workshop mainly targeted the next generation students or researchers and i hope that they have got some idea on the challenges one face in the implementation of applications at millimeter wave regime this this kind of interactions will definitely and hopefully will make the researchers and student community the need to take problem statements communication applications catering civilian or defense communities i i am very happy and thank thank you all attendees that means that means faculties from various universities across the globe scientists industries working with various organization across the universe to spare their valuable time with us and make this event a fruitful one i am also happy with the enthusiasm shown by the student community who attended the workshop and i would request them to utilize this ap mtt platform to reach interact and associate with as per meter wave domain and join these kind of society chapters and get yourselves technically benefited and also i would like to thank the office bearers of mtts kerala session led by the visionary dr chinmay saha we are very thankful to you sir and we are very obliged to you sir for bring bring up such initiatives and the uh, and the way we conducted the many technical events of of online events during the uh, lockdown period we are very thankful to you sir and also the initiatives in, initiated by our bearers office bearers and our main ob objective is to motivate the future generations and do research or associate and contribute in relevant areas as per the requirements of industry involving multidisciplinary approach also acknowledging the tireless efforts and commitment of our ap mtt student members to our session with this concluding thank you thank you thank you sir uh, before leaving can uh, we have a word out to you uh, shivada uh, or chinmay sir for further proceedings Any, any formalities due? Yes, sir. Uh, can we have a virtual photo shoot before leaving? Yeah, sure. So for that, you are you are requesting people to turn on, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sales done. Thank you. Thank you.
have a good day new year happy new year merry christmas merry christmas happy new year so with this yeah thank you thank you thank you